afternoon, everybody. Welcome in. It is over in Chicago. Rutgers over Michigan in the Big Ten tournament. Michigan bowing out uh, by double figures in the Windy City to the Scarlet Knights. This is the Michigan Basketball Post Game Live. I'm Dennis Fithian. It's great to be with you here. And, you know, Michigan, their season is likely over now. They needed to, I would think, at least get this victory. Uh, they probably needed more, but uh, it's not going to be a fun selection Sunday. I don't think Michigan's going to be, you know, rolling in the cameras and, you know, having everybody – uh, sitting around looking at the names rolling out. Uh, I think they, they know their fate and their fate is that, um, you know, that they'll be home this year for the first time, Michigan. I know there's pandemic season in 2020. Nobody played. So you have to go back to the 2015 season. John Beeline's team didn't make the tournament and, you know, Michigan ends up with their final record of 17 and 15, 11 and 10 and a lot of, uh, you know, shoulda, wouldas, and what if they could have won some close games? Uh, that's going to be part of it as you talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about this game. You can always get him feedback wise, whatever you want to do uh, to get your thoughts here on this game, on this season. Uh, what cost Michigan today? What cost Michigan this season? You know, the, the numbers when the season is over here, six times, a half dozen times this year, Michigan was sitting there with under 10 seconds to go with the possession, with the ball. They had the ball, and they had a chance to take the lead or or, or tie the game inside the uh, final 10 seconds six times this year uh, in regulation or overtime, and they lost all of those games. So, you know, you got to win a couple of those ball games. you got to be able to figure out how to make some plays in, uh, in crunch time, enough plays to be able to get yourself enough victories if you want to be in the NCAA tournament and you know, that's uh, they weren't able to now today. Uh, today was a gigantic disappointment. Like, you know, you, you have to come out and play like, you know, the way Michigan played against um, Indiana after, you know, the, the first 10 minutes, uh, well, actually the, the, you know, with a couple minutes to go in the half and then the way they played against Illinois for the majority of that game, you know, the, the team played like, their NCAA tournament life depended on it. They played like there was no tomorrow. They played with desperation and they didn't really play like that today. You know, they got off to a good start, but it was actually Rutgers that actually just uh, frustrated them and then just slammed the door on them in the second half. I, you know, say an embarrassing second half. It was a little bit of an embarrassing second half. You know, I'm watching uh, the game and, and Hunter Dickinson had, uh, 13 points at the half. And, you know, they, they talked to the head coach for Rutgers, Steve Peichel, you know, you, you see the coaches at the half and, you know, he's like, Hey, pretty good game. We got to stop Dickinson. It's the, you know, the, that's going to be what our focus is. That's what he says. And, you know, like, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, the Michigan staff heard that or not, but that's what Rutgers did. They surrounded Hunter Dickinson. I, I, I wasn't in the Rutgers locker room there in Chicago, but here's what Peichel said. We are not going to allow them to just throw the ball into Hunter Dickinson. We are going to get in front of him. We are going to uh, tip these passes that uh, Rutgers try or that Michigan tries to throw into Hunter Dickinson. We're going to front him. We're going to double him. Uh, when he does catch the ball, we're going to run a guy at him. That's what they decided to do, and it was very effective. And Michigan had no counter, and the 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 passiveness. When you're making an entry pass, sure, you know, you, you have the ball and, and the guy's down low, you throw the ball down to him and then you let him go to work. Rutgers wasn't doing that. Rutgers is like, we're the, the bounce pass or any kind of pass that is going to go in 100 Dickinson, the alarm bells are going off. We're going to try to get that pass before it gets in 100 Dickinson. And how many times? I was counting them at one point, but then I'm like, I'm not going to sit around counting. It. It, it's the story of the game. Michigan would throw a little looping pass in Hunter Dickinson and Rutgers would tip the ball away. Or Hunter Dickinson would get it down low, they would sw swat it away. Or Hunter Dickinson would have it, they'd come from behind, and they would take it away from him. And Michigan had no answers. You say, well, what are the answers? There's a lot of answers. 
The answer is, first of all, is getting very strong with the ball when you're passing and you're making the entry pass and when you're posting up. It wasn't, they weren't allowing uh, the entry passes there. So you had to be a lot stronger, both passer and receiver in that situation, or you had to get Dickinson out. Now, Hunter Dickinson didn't get any help from anyone in this game. Michigan scored one field goal for almost the entire second half. There was a minute to go. They finally got another one. But other than that, one lousy field goal, power outage, uh, however you want to look at it. Outplayed, I mean, like, outcoached. It was a very poorly coached second half by Michigan. They had no answers. They had no adjustment for what it was was obvious to what anybody that's ever watched basketball, what was going on, and Michigan just had no answers for it. Now, it would have been it would have felt better if Michigan had somebody stepping up on the outside, anybody that could have made some baskets in the second half, could have made some threes, could have made uh, some post ups, could have made anything because nobody made anything. So nobody made anything, which just exasperated everything because Michigan had one thing going. They had Hunter Dickinson and Rutgers was going to be all over that and they were going to make somebody else beat them and nobody could step up and do anything. So it was a very, very troublesome, disappointing second half effort as Michigan bows out in the Big Ten tournament where if they could have found a way to win the game, they could have put themselves in position where they could have uh, went out there and played against Purdue and forced their way into the NCAA tournament. But now, now the off season begins where everybody looks at him and says, what happened? What's going on? What's the future going to look like for this team? And for, you know, the, the next couple of days, uh, people will, you know, cause, and this is, and look, you know, there'll, there'll be some Michigan fans. Look, this is a Michigan podcast. They'll be like, Oh, you know, let's be positive and let's uh, you know, let's root for the team. Those things are all fine. And those things are good, but also you want passion from your fan base and you want to say, what was really going on out there? And this isn't like the old days where there's nothing else going on. And you know, you just got your maize and blue pom-poms. People understand a little bit about college basketball. And if they don't understand with the X's and the O's or what's going on, they watch enough to say, that's not uh, a a well-prepared team. That is not good basketball. And, you know, today in the second half uh, reminded me a little bit of, I don't know if it reminded me of the game. Michigan can go back to that central game where they lost uh, to, you know, uh, wrap up 2022. And they can look at themselves in the mirror and they can, they can say why. And I don't know the reason. I don't know if they were out all night the night before. I don't know if they had, you know, uh, you know, bad tuna fish sandwiches before the game. I don't know if every single one of them didn't sleep good for some reason. I don't know what the reason is, but they played like dogs against central Michigan. And yeah, not the kind of dog that everybody talks about that. I got the dog in me. They played like a bunch of dogs that were sleeping and there was no excuse for that. I didn't watch that game. It wasn't uh, available unless you had the Big Ten Plus. I listened to Terry Mills, the former Wolverine. And five minutes in, he's like, well, Michigan looks a little sleepy. Ten minutes in, he's like, you know, Michigan looks a step slow. Fifteen minutes in, he's like, I don't like the effort from Michigan. At the half, he's like, Michigan has got poor effort here. He said it another half dozen times in the second half. Michigan's not bringing the effort here today against Central Michigan. That's inexcusable. So they were doing something. Unless they just decided that, you know, that they were just going to, you know, slide around out there because it was central. Well, that's on the coach. But maybe it's on the players. I, you know, I haven't figured out exactly what was going on there. And then all the close losses, you know, you, it's, and, and there is a, a, a part like, hey, it's good that you're able to stay in ball games. But, you know, there's a million teams that can stay in a ball game to a minute or two. You know, the the side of the road is littered with teams that don't make up the NCAA tournament or that are mid teams or that are bad teams that stay in ball games left and right, but can't make a play down the stretch to save their life. That's what this team is. 
So while it's a uh, a fact that you know, hey boy, you know they can stay in a ball game. Boy, they can really stay in a ball game. But they can't make a winning play, enough winning plays, to save their uh, season. And that's the tale of the tape for this Michigan team. Very disappointing, and they all have to look themselves in the mirror. There was another point in that Iowa game. You know, John Howard is usually very um, supportive of all of his players. And, you know, I've heard him talk enough because, like, he said, oh, he'll, you know, you'll hear it from people on Twitter. You'll hear it from the fans. You know, they'll be browbeating him. So he just, you know, takes the the uh, approach. Like, he's just going to be positive. I understand that. And, you know, almost every other coach does the same thing. Izzo will throw his players while, uh, uh, you know, patting them on the back. Then he'll throw them under the bus. He's got that passive-aggressive thing that we've seen. But this isn't about Tom Izzo. This is about Juwan Howard. He's almost always positive about his team, except after that Iowa game. He's like, I don't know what they were doing. Maybe it was the Indiana game. I'm not sure. They're not, they weren't listening. They weren't listening to the coaches. So I've got two examples this year that are pretty frustrating. If you're just watching the ball games and you're like, what's going on with Michigan basketball? The Central Michigan game. What were they doing the night before? What did they eat the day, the, the day before the game? What was the pregame meal? Why wouldn't they give an effort, any effort, against Central Michigan, that they think that they were uh, they were too good because they had played some MAC teams that had taken them to the freaking wire. There was no reason to be, uh, you know, a big time in anybody. They had no room to big time anybody this year, and yet here they were, big time in Central? Or they had a bad pregame meal, or, you know, they were out all night the night before. I don't know what it was. That's just the way it looked. Not to me, to the home broadcast team. I want to know what they talked about at the half. Let's just keep going to Hunter. Well, what happens when, you know, Rutgers is very aggressive and starts going after the back? Let's make sure that these entry passes, that we're not just looping them in there. We're not just, you know, you know, b- b- bouncing it in there, you know, like this is some kind of a uh, pickup game. Michigan was playing pickup entry pass uh, ball today in the tournament, in the Big Ten tournament, with their tournament lives at stake. They were patting the ball. They couldn't have been any more like just like uh, uh, casual with their possessions. What is it, you know? So – they're not good enough. We know that. And they didn't coach very well today. And I've been standing up for Juwan Howard because I think he's in a lot of these games, he's put the guys in position. They just haven't been able to make the shots. But not today. Howard was right there with him. He he took today off. What was he doing last night? You know, he's in his hometown. Maybe he was out. It could, you know, what was the staff doing? They didn't want to continue. I want to check the bus. I don't think Michigan packed for more than one day. I think they all showed up and everybody's like, hey, where's the cases and everything? In case we got to be here for four days. Everybody's like, we don't need anything. We're good. Nobody packed for more than one day. Did Juwan Howard pack for more than one day? Hunter might have packed for more than one day. That's it. Nobody else thought they were going to play for more than one day today. These guys have already, they've, they've got their off-season eyes. And, you know, and maybe it's, uh, you know, where I'm heading to the NBA or I'm out of here. Good. The quicker you can make the decision that way, the better. I'm a little perplexed about some of the, the, the rotations in these couple of these games. I get that Joey Baker airmailed the ball with everything on the line to tie the game up in the double overtime against Illinois. I get it. it uh, you know, sucked for him. Really did. You know, it's uh, every kid's dream. And he blew it. Totally blew it. And then it was worse for him the next game against Indiana because Michigan was dying for somebody to hit an outside shot and they wouldn't put him in. He had to be sitting down there on the bench going, not only is my worst fears realized where I airballed the shot, but now the coaches, nobody has any confidence in me. And that must have been a tough couple nights for Joey Baker. His entire basketball career, nobody believes in him, and he's sitting down there. And then today, they decide, hey, we're going to put him in. 
kind of a surprise. I went, no, we, didn't, we didn't trust him against Indiana, but now we do. Okay. All right. Whatever. I wasn't there at practice. I didn't see, you know. And then right at the end of the half, you know, Michigan or uh, Rutgers had made their run. And Michigan threw the ball to Joey Baker with the clock running down. And he dialed up a three. And I thought, oh, no, if he shoots an air ball, this is going to be one of the worst uh, – one of the worst scenes that I've ever seen. I feel, but you know what? He drilled it. Nothing but air. It was wet. Boom. Big splash. I felt great for the kid. That had to feel really good running off the floor. He couldn't get on the floor in the second half. I don't understand that. Michigan couldn't make a shot in the second half. Not one single shot is all they made. One. But they couldn't bring in Baker. Now, if he didn't make any in the first half, they just may have decided with the staff, like, he's a self-check. It's over. His career's over, which I get. It's harsh. It's big boy basketball. It's harsh. But he made one. So why wouldn't you put him back out there? Why is Terrence Williams II, TW2, like, ah, you know, now I'm Michael Jordan. I'm in the Windy City. He probably went out and saw the statue. Because now he's with a clock running down. Instead of taking it hard to the basket, a guy that has showed up on the score sheet like once every two weeks, maybe once a month. Once two weeks is generous. But he sees the statue of Jordan and rather than saying, I'm going to take the ball hard here, he decides that he's going to come up with some Jordan – Fade away on the baseline with don't like what? You're not MJ TW2. You're not MJ. He was thought he was MJ. Everybody likes Kobe Bufkin, myself uh, included, but if uh, if you're you know, I, I know that. It, he had a nice end of the season and he's a young guy and everything. But if I'm an NBA team, I, am I picking that guy in the first round right now? Absolutely not. This was not a very positive for Bufkin. If uh, his handlers or himself, look, I didn't like these guys can all do whatever they want. Good luck. He didn't look anything like any kind of NBA prospect today. And Jet Howard. Made a couple baskets at the end of the Illinois game. Made a big one. They would have never went into overtime, let alone double overtime against Illinois. But Jet Howard, a, a long time ago, there was a, a basketball player named Dominique Wilkins. You may have heard of him. The human highlight film. He could dunk. He was one of the greatest players of all time. Certainly one of the greatest dunkers of all time. He actually should have won the dunk contest over Jordan in Chicago. You know, back in 85. But that's not really what I'm talking about. And I'm not even talking about Dominique. I'm talking about his brother. Dominique had a brother named Gerald Wilkins. And here's the thing about what Gerald Wilkins would do. You would watch a game when Wilkins, uh, he was playing for the Knicks. And Gerald Wilkins would go off. Like Gerald Wilkins would get the ball. And you'd be like, wow, Gerald Wilkins looks like an all-star. This Gerald Wilkins is a great player. But then the second quarter would start. And Gerald Wilkins wouldn't do anything. And then he would get to the second half and he would barely play. Sometimes he'd be in the fourth quarter and, and they would almost always say the same thing, the announcer. Gerald Wilkins had 12 points in the first quarter and now he has 13. Shot a free throw in the, in the third. Guy averaged 12 points in the first quarter and 1.2 points the rest of the game for his career. Jed Howard, a little streaky. But he starts the game, and, you know, he looks like if these NBA scouts are watching the first five minutes of the game, they're like, we're going to take Jet Howard in the lottery. But if they showed up late, they're like back in the uh, in the media room having some of the free food or something. They got out there like five, six minutes into the game, and they're like, uh, well, let's start watching Jet Howard. They're like, this guy, you know, this guy completely disappears. This guy's a little lax with the ball. This guy doesn't demand the ball. He didn't play any defense, We knew, but he doesn't do anything. Hopefully they were there for the entire game if they're out there scouting them. If you're a good scout, don't be back in the media room grabbing some extra free food. Uh, you know, get out there for the start of the game. Are you going to miss it? 
Jed Howard's the greatest first five minute player in basketball that I've ever seen. But he's going to have to be a little bit more consistent than that. Having said that, I hope he comes back to Michigan. I hope Kobe Bufkin. I loved what I saw from him this year. I didn't think that he was a, a player of the Big Ten after what I saw from last year. I thought, man, it'd be nice coming off the bench. But if you're counting on Kobe Bufkin, and then he just demolished all that. Almost every game, he'd go out and say, well, how do you like me now? Look at how I'm playing. Fabulous year. Not today. Not today. But for the majority of the season, he was fabulous. So that's where I'm at. That's all I have to say about this year's team. I'm going to take some of the feedback and read it here. I'll go through the game as I took some notes and I'll put those, uh, those notes up on the screen, but let's take a little bit and see what people on the feedback or anybody that's, uh, you know, listening out there and want to get a call in, you can do that as well. You can do that on Twitter. Raise your hand. You can get in and uh, I'll put you up. And you can say whatever you would like if you want to get in. Chris on Twitter says, this was the hardest game to watch. This team is not even worthy of an NIT bid. Chris, that's very harsh. Now, today they didn't look like they were NIT worthy. But the record says they are NIT worthy. So you have to have a a winning record to be NIT worthy. So... They will be in the nobody's interested tournament besides, you know, save a few Michigan fans. Jason says he sw- was swearing or he just says, I swear they need to draw up something other than Hunter down low. This could be a long game. So he was uh, sending feedback during the game, Jason. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he, during the game, six minutes left. Horrible. Uh, he's talking about Juwan needing serious help uh, during the game. It was getting out of hand. Uh, and you know, he did not like what is, uh, what was going on. He's quoting the announcer. If I was Michigan, I would draw something up for Hunter. JP said he can't watch this anymore. And, you know, I, I get that part. The, the second half was one of the, um, was one of the worst halves of basketball with what was at stake in, in Michigan history. Unfortunately, you know, like, let's just call it what it is. You want to, you know, you want something else? I'm just telling you what I saw. And after every game, you know, I've tried to give this team, you know, I'm a glass half full type guy. But, you know, the glass is not half full as we sit here today, or it's half full of uh, Drano. Jason is apologizing for being salty during the game. He said it was crazy. Let's get some more in here. Like, if I'm over here yelling and screaming about it, what are people going to be saying on the chat? Well, I think you can expect a lot of saltiness, as Jason put it. Daniel said it was a pathetic effort, embarrassing. Thank God it was at noon and the whole country didn't see it. Wow. Well, Daniel, I can't disagree with you there. Scott says, I have not been part of the Fire Juwan crowd, but we cannot go through another year of this to get the obvious need of new leadership. Yeah, well, it's, uh, here's the way I look at it, Scott. I mean, like, it's fi- Juwan Howard deserves criticism. Now, this team didn't get into the tournament. This team had a number of uh, opportunities. Uh, they had big leads in a lot of games against good opponents could hang on to it. They had uh, a half dozen times. They, they had the ball with 10 seconds to go to ch- and, and they couldn't win the game. So yeah, some of those are tough luck and man, look at this and look at that. But you know, overall you got to do better as a head coach. You got to do better as a staff. Juwan Howard will know that. And now we have the, in the, in the, uh, in the final analysis, uh, it was a, a disappointing year in a kind of season that can get you fired. Meanwhile, uh, he's not getting fired. That would be a a little bit knee jerk. And, you know, like right after a game where they play pathetic, people are going to be knee jerk. And uh, even, you know, during the season, as the thing was, you know, you'll, you'll, if you don't want to call it knee jerk or whatever else, you know, he's going to get another year. 
whether you like it or not, and he deserves another year in, in my mind. As bad as things went and how it went down, uh, he deserves another year to see what he can do. And, you know, knowing Ward Manuel, I know Jim Harbaugh was accomplished before you know, he came into Michigan, but, you know, Jim Harbaugh got uh, as long as leash as anybody could have ever gotten. And Juwan Howard is going to get a leash at least uh, next year. Heck, now, if we're sitting here at the same time next year, um, you know, it could be, you know, I'm not over here saying, let's, you know, look at how long Jim Harbaugh got. You know, that's getting ahead of ourselves saying if I'm going to be in the same spot next year. But this offseason, you know, sure, you can say you can say anything you want, and almost all of it would be true. But Juwan Howard does not deserve to be fired over this. So I don't know, like you might not like that, Scott, and you might just be ready for hockey uh, tomorrow night against Ohio state. And uh, I get that. D's is jumping in and D's says, I'm not going to do what you think I'm going to do and freak out. Frankly, I'm done with Michigan basketball to the Howard's plural Dickinson and all of them are gone. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit of freaking out. Like, you know, and I get it again, like we're only trying to be measured when you ask people like to get all fired up for the team and, you know, follow the team passionately. And then they put a performance like this together, you know, showing up afterwards and saying, Hey, you know, guys have a great off season. We'll be back for you. And you will be. You know, there's a lot of things like, well, Hunter Dickinson's still a good college basketball player. I hope he comes back to Michigan. I already said the same thing about Jet and Juwan. Now, Jace, I don't know. Jace was, um, you know, didn't bring much this year, but I don't know where he's going. Maybe off scholarship. Scott's looking towards the the track championships. I like how people, you know, this is what you do. You get your mind somewhere else. Get yourself to the track championships. Get yourself to, you know, hockey. D's following up and wants to talk about a highlight. About them not boxing out the free throw shooter. He missed it, got it, his own rebound and scored. He's talking about his niece's girls basketball, knows how to box out. WTF twice. Yeah, that was, um, that was bad. That was bad. You know, if you're at your niece's basketball, I don't know what, you know, how old she is, but you see that and you're like, whoever the coach is, it's like, you know, we work on that. We work on boxing out, but you know, this is big time basketball. That was an embarrassment. Dees. I, uh, I forgot. I wasn't going to bring that up. I for, I forgot about that, but now that you mention it, you know, that was terrible. It was. And they deserve to be criticized. Everybody. For that one single play. That was horrible. Eric says it was embarrassing. Hopefully they return everyone to salvage Juwan's job. Never would have happened under B-line. He would take an eight seed to win the tournament and not shoot under 10% in the second half. Yeah. Well, remember, even after... Um, you know, I was thinking of John Beeline today because I was going back when this Jim Beheim retired uh, yesterday or whether it was the day before. I think it was last night. And so I was recalling things with Jim Beheim. Of course, Michigan beat Syracuse in 2013 in the Final Four to get to the championship game. John Beeline. But after the championship game, John Beeline, I was thinking, oh, John Beeline's going to start recruiting even, you know, he's going to recruit better. He's going to start grabbing five stars. I don't know he had the monster McGarry and stuff on that team, but he he continued kind of going after guys from New Hampshire and, you know, stuff like this, you know, kind of odd, you know, his way of recruiting. I'd say odd. It worked for him, obviously, and he's you know, was a great coach. But they didn't make the tournament. And then in, in 2015, they didn't make the tournament. And then the next year, they, they made the play in. And yeah, so, and, and it's tough for Juwan Howard. This is when they say it's tough to follow a legend. 
Because people think about um, John Beeline, and they just think John Beeline was the greatest coach of all time, and John Beeline's team would have, you know, they never played, you know, poorly. They always showed up. They always rang the bell, you know, that kind of stuff. And so when you have to follow somebody like Beeline, it, it um, you know, things that you do, you, you get no credit. I've seen, you know, uh, Juwan Howard gets no credit for the first year of the Big Ten Championship. Those were the those were Beeline's DNA team, you know, uh, and it's just these last two years. Like now, that's Juwan's team, and there's a little bit of truth to that. But it, the thing is, it's tough to follow a legend. That's why they say that. Todd asking a question: Do you think they play in a tournament like the NIT? Is Hunter Dickinson going to leave for the NBA? Same thing with Kobe. They might even want to transfer, believe it or not. All right, we'll, we'll take these three questions. I think that they should play in the NIT. What's the reason that you wouldn't play in the NIT? Like, you know, they're too good, like they were against Central, you know? Like, they got a lot of – how many times did Juwan Howard this year say, we got the youngest team – young teams need to play basketball and they need the experience. I'd like to see Terrace Reed Jr. and Doug McDaniel get the experience of playing in the NIT, even if nobody's watching it. Even if nobody shows up at the Chrysler Center, I would like to see him play in the NIT. Michigan basketball is not in any spot to be anybody looking down anybody's nose and saying, we're not, we don't play in the NIT. No, they're going to play in the NIT. They should play in the NIT. Is Hunter Dickinson going to leave for the NBA? Hunter Dickinson might leave, and he might want to leave for the NBA, but Hunter Dickinson is not going to play in the NBA. Maybe he'll play uh, like in Japan. Like uh, the big man from Illinois last year, if you remember him, Kofi Coburn. Pretty good player. He's not playing in the NBA. He went to Japan. Make a couple hundred thousand. I guess you could even make a million in Japan. But I don't know how much NIL, not NIT, NIL Hunter Dickinson's getting. It would Michigan give him enough to come back where... You know, he's not thinking about, you know, going to Japan. I, I think he would get more than he would on some kind of uh, two-way contract. Maybe not, you know, of, of playing like in the G League for an NBA team. I think it's more likely than not that Hunter Dickinson comes back. I like Hunter Dickinson as a player. I didn't care for the, the ski mask routine. I also didn't care for him, you know, calling another team's fan base scumbags. I know some people is like, that's what college basketball is all about. That's what the guy that was doing the podcast said of him. I saw a former Wolverine who did, or maybe he still does a podcast, uh, Stu Douglas, saying that, you know, he really liked the ski mask. I didn't. And I like to show a, a certain amount of respect for the game. I've never seen anyone you know, walk in wearing a ski mask at a basketball game. And then, you know, you lost the game too. And, you know, calling the other team, you know, it, this isn't um, big time wrestling. If he wants to go into big time wrestling, go into big time wrestling. It's college basketball. Show some respect for the game and your opponent. You want to go on podcasts and talk? Talk. Call another team's uh, scumbags. You know, I would like, hopefully he can clean a little bit of that up. But like I said, I like him as a player. I hope he comes back. I don't know what Buffkin, you know, Buffkin and Jed Howard are the ones that they pop up in mock drafts in the first round. And as we saw last year with Caleb Houston, who didn't go in the first round or Musa Diabati, you can still get three, four, four million dollars. I think Houston got guaranteed and he wasn't even a first round pick. So when you say like, uh, you know, those guys don't look really like, but it doesn't matter what they look like. What it matters is if a team drafts them. Because I was looking, you know, the the guy that got picked, he was from Kansas. Okabaji, I think, went to Cleveland with the 15th pick. That's where I see a, saw a Jet projected. That guy got 20 million guaranteed. Doesn't really matter if Jet, you know, is ready to play or not. If somebody's going to give you 20 million guaranteed, you can go. And it's the same thing with Kobe. You know, if he's thinking, somebody's going to give me at least $4 million guaranteed? You know, he could take off. I hope they make their decision sooner rather than later. I'd like to have them both back, but 
you know, I don't know, you know, getting dangled, getting anywhere from, you know, four to $20 million thinking about I'm out. I can understand taking the money. Mark, um, ready to go over to the women's gymnastics team. So we've had track and field, hockey, women's gymnastics. There you go, Mark. Basketball team looks scarily like the Washington Generals. Team that loses to the Harlem Gold Trotters. There you go. Hadley's ready to move on, too. Let's just talk about football. There you go, there you go Hadley. Hadley's got his Michigan play sheet over there. Michigan loses, go to Michigan football. You always have that one. No matter what sport you're there, Michigan loses. Any sport, talk Michigan football. That's a good one, Hadley. That is a, it's a good, always default. But yeah, go to track and field, go to hockey, go to women's basketball. Hadley, who is the biggest Michigan fan that I have ever, and I've known him now for a couple of years. This is a really, and he is a very positive guy here, but he is, this is very insulting towards his maize and blue when he types in, I'm not even watching them in the NIT. Ooh. I mean, this is pretty harsh stuff. You're talking about Hadley, who all day, every day is rooting for Michigan. And he is not watching. The NIT. Hockey. Let's see. Robert is getting in. He says he's talking NIT. The team needs to decline in the NIT invite. It's a bad team that needs to stay home and focus on fundamentals like boxing out. Yeah, you change your opinion, Robert. I mean, look, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, you can work on boxing out in the NIT. You know, it's a, it's another team. They they need to work. You need the the, the simulated action. We say you know, go home, just go home. You know, you just don't, and, and nobody can, but the team needs it. But you know, the even if it's Terrace Reed shooting free throws or Doug McDaniel running the team as a point guard and whoever else that you might want to put out there. But yeah, I mean, like, I don't think they should decline the uh, NIT bid. You know, it's it's pretty bad here. Mark's talking about making them look like Rutgers, or making Rutgers look like Houston. Dees didn't like, uh, you know, some of the criticism here. Robert saying, "Why are you talking about these guys going to the NBA?" I don't know. They showed up in some of the mock drafts. Graham jumping in, saying that Michigan doesn't deserve to be in. And no, they they got a winning record. They do deserve. I mean, what are we talking about? The NIT or are we talking about the NCAA tournament? Let's let's just clarify that. Nobody thinks that they deserve to be in the NCAA tournament, but 17 and 15 does qualify them for the NIT grant. Kent says, asking a question, has Jawan showed anything positive? They need to go back into the workshop and start with fundamentals. Well, let's pick up that question. Has Jawan shown anything positive in the second half of the game today? No. No. I, I That was one of the worst halves that I've ever seen uh, from any coach at any level. At basketball, so that was you know he, he ended on a uh, with on a real negative. Uh, this year, did they show anything positive? You know, they they fought to the end, they played hard. I mean, these are not nice. These are things that you know you don't care about when a team doesn't get into the tournament. You know, uh, besides the however you felt about the Dickinson mask routine and you know calling other teams scumbags. You know they they. They played hard and weren't really embarrassing, you know, the university, you know, they didn't have anything like that off the court. But, you know, in, in Juwan's first year, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, Juwan Howard, like this, and, and talking about him positively right now, it's not really like, 
what people want to hear. But I saw the team when, because I I didn't know, you know, Juwan Howard, Fab Five, was that going to work when it came down to recruiting and all that? Well, I didn't know what kind of coach he was going to be. But the first year I saw the team play in the, the, I don't know, was it a preseason tournament? Yeah, they went down to Atlantis in the Bahamas. And, you know, I watched the team and I'm like, oh, this team is, uh, this team looks well coached. This team's got some flow on offense. Uh, I liked how they played, man. They, 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 they played together. And I saw the X's and O's. And, and I know that everyone's like, oh, it was all John Beeline's guys. Not all of them. And you still have to, as a coach, when you come in, you know, there's a lot of guys like Castleton and J- Julius. I mean, they jump ship. You have to retain some of the players. So that's one thing. You're also, you know, you have to coach them in the preseason and then come up with a starting five. And then you have to work the rotations. And then in a game, you got to sub guys in and out. And you got to draw up the plays and get them ready. I mean, those are no small things. Everybody's like, it's just the other coach's team. No, that was his first year, and I saw it against um, uh, down there in that Atlantis tournament. I saw a well-coached team and a team that could play together, so I thought that was a positive. Michigan would have made the tournament that year if uh, there wasn't a pandemic. Nice job, Jawan Howard. Now, his second season, they won the Big Ten. And in Juwan Howard, uh, during the pandemic, was uh, an outstanding representative for the University of Michigan. I thought he handled, and it's no small thing to handle all the stuff that was going on with the pandemic. I thought Howard did a fabulous job. And the team responded out on the floor, and they won the Big Ten. And they deserve the credit. He deserved the credit. And, you know, he, he um, what I found with that team is that If you surround Hunter Dickinson with four shooters, you got something going. This Dickinson can be a force. And then if you don't have any holes on the outside and, you know, he brought in Mike Smith and Shawnee Brown, those guys, he hit the jackpot in the transfer portal. I thought, nice job. Nice coach. Fabulous. I mean, he came a, uh, well, they had three shots with like under 30 seconds to go, including Franz Wagner, a wide open three. To beat UCLA, they would have been in the Final Four. You know, he would have had that on his resume already, which would have been really nice. So, fabulous season. Uh, I saw a lot from Juwan Howard that year. Now, last year, it was rough. It was rough most of the way, but they found a way. They had Devontae Jones late, kind of rounded into form. They made plays in some big games late, like down at at Ohio State without Hunter Dickinson, and got into the tournament in – and beat Colorado State, and then beat Tennessee. And they turned a a, a kind of not-so-hot regular season into a positive. Last year was a good – ended up being a good season for Michigan. This year, a lot of it was following those same lines. Like, you didn't know, and, then you know, they could have ended up with one freaking shot. You know, maybe they would have had a chance, you know, to do some things. But, you know, this year ends up being a bad season. So – I know that was a long answer to if I seen anything, you know, from Jawan Howard. And the answer to me is I have seen some things. Scott is talking about uh, the offensive effort, but they really suck on defense. Beeline's team became better on defense as the season matured. Beeline figured out that he was not all that good of a defensive coach himself. And he brought in Luke Yaklich. And Yaklich uh, had a huge effect on the Michigan defense. It was huge. Again, huge uh, for Michigan. So there might be, uh, Juwan might be looking for somebody, you know, with his staff. A lot of times that happens. You have a bad season and you just keep everything rolling or, you know, do you make a change with the staff? Sometimes you do. You know, Michigan doesn't have very good numbers defensively. They weren't, you know, if you look at uh, Ken Palm, I think they're in the 50s. But if you look at Michigan's, Defensive efficiency, they're in the hundreds of this team. And they don't really have – Dickinson usually guards his opposite number pretty well. I mean, he's not the greatest defender, but he's he's not half bad. I I don't mind Dickinson as a defender. But I don't know. Doug McDaniel's on the small side, so I think he gets taken advantage sometimes. But he gets some quick hands, and he comes up with some steals. 
Bufkin's made a lot of strides. Last year he was terrible. But who this team, they don't guard very well. They don't have, they're not really, they don't sit down and get after you. And, you know, that's just not in your face. You know, they're not a very good defensive team. So that's part of it. They were more, and, and you know, that's, I know that it's got to hurt Juwan Howard because that's what he emphasizes and everything else. Uh oh. We've got um, Laurent talking about Ohio State being scumbags. Yeah, that's true. I'm, we're with you on that. Um, here's people asking me about wrestling and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, there's going to be some other things. At, at the NIT, I think will be a lock. I guess. Yeah, I mean, the NIT will want Michigan in there. NIT will. Uh, Michigan will probably host a first round NIT game. Michigan Bradley, Tuesday at the Chrysler Center. Who's in? Count 22. Did not like the effort today. We've already been down the Fire Jawan Road. Uh, we know that that is not happening. So let me just go through the, the game a little bit. Chris bringing back uh, what he was saying last game about the point guard. Pretty much starts and ends there. Too much pressure on the other young and soft players. Nice hair, though. Yeah. Here's somebody that wants to just give, uh, doesn't want to give Juwan any credit for the first two years because of Beeline's players. You know, there's a point, like I said, we can go over that. Mostly when people, they only use it negatively. You know, when you're, you're following a legend, it, it's never like, uh, you still have to, you still have to get things out of those players. It's fine. You know, there's a lot of people that agree with you. They love saying that. That is Beeline's teams. Give no credit to Juwan Howard. Let's look at this game. In the first half, all the way back at noon today, seems like a long time ago now, you know, Michigan actually looked pretty good at the start of the game. For the majority of the first half, they were out there and like, okay. But, you know, Rutgers was staying around. They made this 8-0 run. And they got close, took a little bit of a lead. Michigan came back. Rutgers took a little bit. And then Joey Baker drains a three at the buzzer to give Michigan a three-point lead at the half. Hunter Dickinson led all scores at the half. And then they interviewed Steve Peichel, the Rutgers coach, at the break. And he's like, we got to deal with Hunter Dickinson. And, oh, they dealt with Hunter Dickinson. Because Michigan in the second half is like, let's just keep going to Hunter Dickinson. And U of M got down for the first uh, time out on the floor. Four minutes in, they were down five. Then they were down six with nine minutes to go. They got kind of hovering in there. But the only thing that Michigan had going in the second half, it wasn't a lot. They just were trying to feed it to Hunter Dickinson in the post. And, you know, the Scarlet Knights were were doing everything they could to stop that. Stealing the ball, jumping the inbounds pass, and everything else. And Michigan had no counters. They had nobody else stepping up doing anything else. And it was really frustrating to watch. This is where the game was won. It was with six and a half to go. Rutgers got a backside steal from Dickinson. He didn't see the guy coming, ripped the ball from him, went down, got a score. They got it down to Dickinson again. He got blocked. And then there was a three-pointer, and just like that, you know, there was a five plays. You know, they were down six with six and a half. That was doable. But giving up those five plays, this sequence right here, this was the ball game. The steal and score. The block and three down 11. That was pretty much your ball game. Michigan could make a basket to save their tournament life. One field goal in the second half to like a minute to go. That's too big of a scoring drought to beat anybody. Well, you know, they're down 13. Buffkin had a miss. No one got back. That was one of those things like the, like the, uh, the walk-in layup from the guy that shot it. That was like, um, you know, junior high type stuff or, Middle school type stuff, you know, that's not going to make you look good. This one didn't either. They're down 11. You know, they got to let everything all hang out. Buffkin just misses a, a shot. You know, no no sin there. But, you know, letting the other team leak out and get a layup to make it 13, it was over. No production in the second half. Steven Bardo said that they looked tentative. Yeah, yeah, they, they looked tentative. They sure did. 
Let's check the upcoming schedule. That is brought to you by Maze and Blue Reviews. Good afternoon. Michigan football and basketball, 1 o'clock weekdays, means that this feed right now that you're listening to, watching, will be here tomorrow at 1 o'clock. I was uh, hoping that Michigan was going to be playing Purdue, but as you know, that's not the case. The schedule is pretty easy to go over now. You look at the bracket. And the 8-9 game, I have went ahead with the Sharpie and put Rutgers against Purdue tomorrow. Got the Spartans that are playing today. You've got, I'm sorry, the Spartans are not playing today. I skipped ahead. I was looking at tomorrow's lineup with Rutgers and Purdue. You got Ohio State and Iowa who are playing right now in a low scoring game. And then you got Penn State, Illinois, and, and Minnesota, the surprise. They got in there against Maryland. State will get the Ohio State Iowa winner tomorrow after the Rutgers Purdue game. So that's it when it comes down to the bracket. I picked uh I picked Michigan. So that doesn't make me feel very good. Uh, the upcoming schedule tomorrow, noon start versus Purdue. That's where Rutgers will be. Michigan, you know, waiting until selection Sunday. Like I would, I would not want to, if they are throwing out like a, uh, selection Sunday, get together party. I wouldn't want to be at that. <laughs> I like parties, but not that kind of party. Come on over. We'll watch the selection show. They got the cameras on us. Everybody's going to be watching the, the peeling off the names. <laughs> the last one comes up. That's not fun. Maybe they'll have a, all right. Maybe they'll have an NIT selection show. I don't, what are you going to do? They deserve a little bit of that. It's not fun. Talking about NIT selection shows, but, you know, that's it. That's where it's at. Count 22. Did not feel like the 18 minutes with one field goal was very good for him. Really? You didn't like that? D's talking about some of the changes that he would like to see with the team. LP talking about uh, basketball just nowadays, saying the kids today have no basic concept of how the game is played, which is why Dickinson was hit in the back instead of uh, the ball, uh, the ball being shot again. Dunks and threes are all kids are about. Yeah, I mean you got a point there. Shy Town getting in, saying he's a Michigan fan, but Howard must be fired. Yeah, that's not happening. Like, look, I think that uh, I'm gonna repeat myself here again. Shy Town, and I appreciate the uh, the tip and everything. And you wanting to go after Tony Bennett, but, and, and I understand, like, I don't think, uh, I, mean, I get the, fr- I mean, like you should be really frustrated. I mean, you're a Michigan fan, this, this team uh, underachieved. What happened against central Michigan? Why wasn't this team listening to the coaches? Uh, when, you know, Juwan Howard was asked, you know, what was going on and he's never said a crossword with his team. And he's like, they weren't listening to me. Where was the effort in the second half today that they had against Indiana and Illinois? All very fair things. Looking at Juwan Howard and saying, hey, you had a really bad year, Juwan. All fair. But, you know, firing him. And look, you know, you you say it. I mean, I got to tell you, like, oh, don't say it. You say whatever you want. But if you're asking me if I was in charge, would I fire Juwan Howard? And the answer would be no. If you're asking me, do I think that Ward Manuel, who gave Jim Harbaugh, who went 0 for 5, would have been 0 for 6 against Ohio State, gave him another year? I, I don't. I, and uh, I, I don't think that. Uh, I, I'll guarantee that Ward Manuel won't fire him now. 
Now look, you know, like, I don't know, you know, it's sports. So you start thinking about like the craziest things that can happen. I don't know. Jawan Howard might want to go to the NBA. I mean, he's not going to get a, I, no team's going to hire him as a head coach. The, you know, the reason I say all this is because John Beeline lives in Ann Arbor and he works right down the street for the Pistons. And you got to, he got old uh, John Beeline right there, but I don't think Juwan Howard's just going to, re- you know, step down. <laughs> I don't think he's going to step down. And I don't think Ward, I mean, it would, you want to get Ward in there and somehow, you know. We'd be in the situation, Chi Town, where, you know, it would be one of the, it would be wild. It would be crazy. I don't know what it'd be wild or crazy. It would just be, Something that nobody is predicting. And I don't even know if it's worth talking about. And meanwhile, I just spent a minute talking about it. But the only reason I talk about it, and I know you're saying Tony Bennett. And I don't know why is Tony Bennett leaving Virginia? I don't know why. I mean, he's he's in a really good spot. I don't think he is. But it's the um it's the beeline piece. It's because he lives in Ann Arbor. That's the only reason I bring it up. I mean, he's right there. He could walk down the Chrysler, probably take him like five minutes. He could be in the building. But that's the only reason I bring it up. That and, the, you know, the terrible conclusion of the season. But I wouldn't do it, and I don't think there's any way that Ward does it. So that's it. We know that Jet and Kobe are not NBA ready, but are they NBA draftable? That's the question. Because I you know I don't I haven't put together a mock draft myself, but I watched the dude from um just two weeks ago from the Athletic put one together and he had Jet going 15, which is at least 20 million guaranteed, and he had Kobe going in the 20s. Kobe played pretty well in the last two weeks, except today. He didn't. You know, so you're talking about, you know, eight, ten million dollars guaranteed, you know. You know, those are tough things. Like you we could sit around talking about they're not NBA ready at all. Who cares? Somebody's gonna give you 20 million. Who cares if you're NBA ready? Yeah, defense was a problem all year long. Andres was fishing. He's been smart. He didn't watch the game. He's sure the box score tells the the tale. Happy Thursday on the spring ball. Yeah, Andre's uh, Michigan scored one field goal in the first 19 minutes of the second half. I think that's right. Pretty close to that. One field goal. Only 20 minutes in the half. They got one, you know, with under a minute, and then Kobe hit one late. One field goal, a couple free throws other than that. Nothing else. That's why they lost the game. Guys got a lot to work on. D saying that Jet is a spot up shooter. He's one dimensional. Uh, he's one dimensional where you would say, He's a scorer. I don't think he's just a spot-up shooter. I think he can spot up, but I also think he can shake somebody out of their shoes and he, he can he can throw a shimmy on you. Next thing, you know, he can uh, take a step back on you. That's not just being a spot-up shooter. And then he can take you to the right and pull up. That's not being just a spot-up shooter. He can take it to the rack. He's, he's He can you know, Euro-step you. He can... Uh, finish with both hands. He's a really nice score. Jet Howard. No, Michigan had a guy that played 19 years in the NBA that reminds me a little bit of Jet Howard by the name of Jamal Crawford. And Jamal Crawford was just giving the ball and, you know, to watch him, you know, throw some shakes and throw up some shots. That's what Jet is. But Jet, you know, 
That was Jamal Crawford. So he still might be a first round pick. Who knows? Okay, couple more here. Couple more. Doing this for an hour. They didn't hit shots all year. The plays got them open all year. I don't know about the plays all year long. Weak passing. I mean, it's uh, we're, we're kind of going over the same stuff here. Let's see. Blake, will Michigan make the tournament? Yes, they will make the NIT tournament, but they're not making the NCAA tournament. No. No, Blake. It's not happening. Uh, you know, I don't sit there. They, they don't deserve to be in the tournament. Look, it doesn't They're not going to get into the tournament. They've got a resume. It's like, I don't know. There's a lot of different things you could put it like. You know, like, uh, it'd be kind of like me applying for like some neurosurgeon job, you know, going through all the things. Yeah, you know, I'm applying, you know. I'm not sitting around holding my breath that I'm going to get a call back. Nah, it's not like that. I know they're, they're, uh, the court is like nobody had him in the tournament. Everybody had him out of the tournament. Nobody had him in that I saw. But they were right in the bubble and then they lost. Now, they may have been in if they just won today. I still don't think. I wouldn't have, I don't think that they would have gotten if they would have just won today. I think they had to beat Purdue too. Then I would have felt okay about their chances. One win, it would have been, you know, I don't know if it would have been the biggest shock in the world, but if somehow Michigan ended up on Sunday, these guys are going to be out, you know. I don't even, I don't think that they're going to be sitting together. They'll be just, you know, somewhere doing whatever. And all of a sudden, Michigan's name, Michigan. I don't think so. I don't know. Like, you know it'd be pretty surprising. Yeah, we bet over the, uh, should Michigan stay or home or whatever else? Let's see. So people are bringing up some crazy things here. Gary says, tell Jim. Well, I think this is tell Jim Scarcelli. Is that what this is? From Tiger Stadium, Domino's 87 from Gary. You put all these th things together here, uh, Gary, is that. I worked at Domino's for a few years, not for the pizza. I was in radio. And then, but I think this is what this means. Jim Scarcelli. You're not, you're not trying to shout me out or something. That's for Scar. I'll try to remember that. In fact, let me see. I can copy this. Boom. I'll tell him you said hi. Chris says Frankie is light years better than McDaniels. I don't believe that. I mean, you can believe that. I and mean, it's pretty close. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but let's, you know, Chris, I like when you joined. You you came in late this season and joined in the chat. And, you know, you're, you get a lot of hot takes. This is pretty hot. You want to say he's better? You, know, you can make a case. I'd have to put up the numbers and look. I like Frankie, you know. But a light year is better? That sounds like an exaggeration to me. And that's it. I'll take three more, and then that's going to do it for the season. David says, Jet jogging back on D, not boxing out, and shooting off balance threes with 15 on. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and I can see that. Andre says, it's odd trolling. I think he sincerely thinks Jet is a great player. Chris again said on Sunday and lost me forever with that insanity. Williams not doing uh, well. All right. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. After every Michigan football and basketball game, it's a disappointment. There's no doubt about that. If Michigan plays in the NIT, I think they will. I'll be on after those games. I think those games are all televised. I think they are. I guess even if they're not, 
I did a few games this year that weren't televised, but it was rough. You know, you Sunday, you know, the, it's just starting now. I remember back when I, Michigan wasn't all that hot in, um, in basketball, you know, like the LRB days and maybe the beginning of the Tommy Amaker. I would, I would go to the, the big 10 tournament in Chicago and in Indianapolis. You know, you get there and there's nothing like it. I mean, it's just a celebration of college basketball the night before you're in Indianapolis, you know, let's face it, you know, you're out partying, you know, you're going for, you know, bar hopping, but you see like all the colors from all the teams and everything. It's great. And you're watching all the games, but you know, back then Michigan, you know, it was, they're playing in the, the first games and then they would get beat and then you're leaving just when everybody else is kind of coming in and getting ready for the, you know, for the weekend. And it happens, you know, I, and, you know, sometimes I'd win some games and then I'd sit there, it's, it's all, all day today, all day tomorrow. It's, you know, these next two days are great. Nice little appetizer for next week. I like Saturday and Sunday too, all throughout, but, you know, going to Chicago and going to Indy in the Big Ten tournament is great. Uh, Michigan, heck, they're probably already home. We know they didn't have to get their bags. I don't think they – I think they packed lightly. That's that's the way it looked. That's the way they played. There you know. Sam showed up only to hit the like button and say thanks. Hello and go blue. That's a good way to end it up. I'll talk with you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Michigan bows out of the Big Ten tournament, 62 to 50. Good night, everybody. Enjoy the week.